Hello and welcome to The Arbitration Conversation. So in this webisode, we have a real treat. We're going to have a friend from the North. So we have Professor Anthony Dempsis. He has been teaching at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He is a, likewise a kindred contract professor as well as a professor of torts, international arbitration, dispute resolution law, and legal writing. Um, he also supervises the common law, Jessup, Viz, and FDI moot courts. So he's helping a lot of students with these moot court competitions, which is fantastic. Um, he also is, um, he advises South Asian countries in the area of foreign investment and investment treaties. And he's called to the Ontario board bar. And he also recently joined the Littleton Chamber in London, England um, as an associate door tenant. So very, very happy to have you. Thank you so much for coming, Professor Dempsis. Well, it's uh, it's absolutely my pleasure. I'm I'm happy. The the one if there's a, something good about COVID, it's that we can actually have these kinds of exchanges. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and recently, um, I know you were involved in writing a brief um, as part of the interveners, which is similar to the Amicus process in the United States. A very important case that recently came out of the Supreme Court of Canada that really caught a lot of people's eyes. Um, and that case was the Uber v. Heller case. So I would love it if you would sort of provide for us a little bit of background about what happened in that case, what the facts were, and the issues for the court. Yes, well, um, basically, Mr. Heller was a driver, may even still be, I'm not sure, for Uber, and had gone along and signed on to become a driver in the usual way, had ostensibly accepted the online terms, and was starting to drive. Well, after a little bit of time, he started to wonder if he was a, an employee. Under the contract, the contract explicitly says that Uber drivers are contractors and therefore not employees. And that's significant because in Ontario, when you're an employee, you automatically have certain rights that are under one of our statutes, the Employment Standards Act. And in particular, those rights give you holiday pay, uh, sick days, certain wage benefits, all of that stuff. So as a contractor, he doesn't get access to them. So the question that he wanted to dispute with Uber was that he is an employee for all intents and purposes. He is not a contractor, notwithstanding what the, what the uh, contract, what the agreement says. And this led to many other Uber drivers feeling the same way and a proposed class action was brought forward to try to to Uber for all the many years of non-holiday uh, pay, et cetera. And I think it's to the tune of $400 million Canadian, which is about 25 cents US, but nevertheless, it's still a lot in Canada. And um, so they, that, the, the proposed uh, class action began and Uber immediately brought forward an arbitration agreement that was in the contract to what we call in Canada, stay the proceeding, essentially to say, Whatever his dispute may be, in the agreement with us, he agreed to use arbitration. Therefore, there cannot be a class action and we cannot move forward, at least in court. So that's really what the Supreme Court had to deal with. It went through the trial level, which agreed with Uber and said, that's true. There's a valid arbitration agreement. Go to arbitration. Now, what's significant about Uber's arbitration agreement with Mr. Heller is that Although Mr. Heller is working in Ontario, the arbitration agreement required him to have his arbitration heard in the Netherlands and under the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce's rules. The long and short of all of that is to even begin to bring a claim before the ICC would have cost Mr. Uber $15,000. That does not include any travel expenses and anything else. And the evidence at trial was that he made or could potentially make up to $30,000 a year. So 50% of his yearly wage would go to uh, just commencing the arbitration. Anyhow, that decision was appealed and the Court of Appeal sided with Mr. Heller and declared that the arbitration agreement was unconscionable but under a test that was very unique to Ontario. It was a four-part test. It had all of these 
aspects to it, and, and even the Court of Appeals' own treatment of the test was questionable. That led Uber to finally appeal to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court had to address finally was, is the arbitration agreement in the Uber contract valid or not? And in the end, the Supreme Court said in a, I suppose it's an eight to one decision, but one of the eight had a concurring, so looked at it a bit differently, but seven of the Supreme Court justices said the arbitration agreement is unconscionable and therefore invalid. It also introduced, at least for Canada, a new element to the analysis of whether to enforce an arbitration agreement, which I'm happy to talk about. But just on the pure unconscionability point, the Supreme Court got rid of the four-part test from the lower court, and instead, some are saying replaced it, but in, in actuality, um, it's, a, it's an old test in Canada that dates back to 1968, and it has two prongs. The first is, proof of inequality in the position of the parties at the negotiation stage. So I think to the U.S. Uh, lawyer, this would sound a lot like procedural unconscionability. And then the second part is proof of an improvident bargain, meaning a bad deal, which I think speaks to the substantive unconscionability part. Of significance in Canada, this new test does away with the notion that it matters if the stronger party is aware of the weaker party's weakness. So in many of our other decisions, that was something that courts actually took into account. They wanted to know whether the stronger party knew of the weakness and was taking advantage of that weakness. And if that couldn't be shown, often the courts would say it's not unconscionable. Here, the Supreme Court said that is irrelevant. Ultimately, what matters is whether this is a bad deal. That's really and, interesting. Yeah, I mean, because I know we were talking about this um, before the, the interview, just about how under U.S. law, so just to give the sort of comparative aspect, which is really interesting, um, we also have this idea of a two-prong test um, of a procedural and substantive procedural focusing on bargaining power, whether it was an adhesion contract, take it or leave it, and then substantive really looking at whether it was a bad deal, as you note. And then also there's some case law in the U.S. that kind of looks at it from a sliding scale, meaning if you have more procedural, then we might not require as much of substantive and vice versa. So in this opinion, do you think with it looking more at substantive, was it using a sliding scale or did the Heller opinion really just focus on substantive? Well, to me, I think it's, it's substantive. And one of the reasons I'd say that is that they introduced this new way of looking at whether to enforce an arbitration agreement. They created a new standard. And this new standard, which is gonna take time to, to put meat on its bone, basically says, is there a real prospect that this arbitration will happen? So this real prospect standard, at least to the best of my understanding, is more or less asking, let's look at everything here. And ultimately, do we think that this clause will ever lead to a real arbitration. And in the court's opinion, they said no, because it wouldn't make any sense for Mr. Heller to spend half of his yearly income just to get a case started to resolve what's probably a few hundred dollar dispute, at least if it's as an individual. So they said, they looked at this clause as quite abusive in the sense that they said, this is just a ploy by Uber to make sure that nobody ever actually goes after them. Therefore, it is, there's not a real prospect that this clause will actually get enforced. And so what this, this will have, in my view, consequences for all other kinds of clauses, this real prospect term, um, will, you, know, you can apply it to anything, whatever that, whether it's an exclusion clause, although we have a separate test for that, whether it's an entire agreement clause, is there any real prospect that the entire agreement clause was put in for a, a valid reason, for a bona fide reason? Is it because there was a lot of back and forth and the parties just said, no, no, we wanna be clear what our agreement is, or was it really a clause put in to more or less sneak the other party into thinking that I know we talked a lot and I know what you really think is going on, but our contract is all it really means. So I, I can imagine that that's where it's gonna go next. 
Um, so did you feel as though, I mean, what's interesting as you're talking, I'm thinking about unconscionability and then also, of course, the comparative aspects with U.S. law. So it seems as though the court was creating almost a special test or brand of unconscionability when you're looking specifically at arbitration. Or was this really a blanket unconscionability rule that does make sense in the different areas like you were saying? I mean, so I'm trying to picture what it would look like. So it makes perfect sense when you're talking about arbitration. Is it going to really happen? Is he going to go to the Netherlands? You know, that makes sense. But how do we apply that in other areas? I mean, is this a special brand of unconscionability only being applied to arbitration? Well, that's a good question. And so I, as much as I'd like to believe it is, the court at paragraph, I think, 50 of its of the majority decision makes an interesting point where they say this could also apply to choice of law clauses. Because they said it's very possible that a party has inserted a choice of law clause really to get away from rules that would otherwise apply. And so they said, we're going to not, we wouldn't allow that either. And uh, one of the arguments I had made, or I, I pointed out as an intervener, it's not that you make arguments, you point out information. And I had pointed out that this contract was in fact governed by Dutch law. So not only was it supposed to go to uh, the Netherlands, but there was a separate choice of law clause, which the trial level and the court of appeal acknowledged and nobody said otherwise. So what I pointed out to our Supreme Court was the question of unconscionability to the extent that a choice of law clause has not been attacked probably needs to be viewed through the lens of the choice of law clause that nobody has disagreed about. And that, I mean, I was, I, I suppose they were listening because in the judgment, they then go ahead and say, oh, and by the way, if you try to insert a choice of law clause, we're going to assume that that's going to be a problem. So respondent, you better prove otherwise. So to answer your question, I don't know that it's exclusive to arbitration, only because of that little reference where they said, also, you can abuse another party by putting in a choice of law clause, and presumably, they'd be open to any other way that you can abuse a party. So let's talk a little bit about the concurrence, because you mentioned the concurrence. So what was the difference, and, and why was there a concurrence? What, did, what, what was the main point of the concurrence? The main point was that Justice Brown, in writing his concurring decision, said, of course I agree with the result, but I don't believe unconscionability is a path you should take. Instead, he was of the view that this came down to a pure question of public policy. Now, as usual, a judge who talks about public policy rarely uh, explains it fully, so he didn't really give us a lot of what he meant by public policy, but uh, I think the best the best I could take from it is for, he was saying this is an offensive clause, again, for the same reason that it'll never get to arbitration. And as he described it, really, he, he looked at it more like, and, and I know the U.S. has a, a much better uh, version of illusory consideration. He looked at it as an illusory contract. He said this clause that is allegedly saying here we have a right to arbitrate disputes, he said, is an illusion because nobody's ever going to go to arbitration. He says it puts up this, it erects a brick wall for any party who actually wants to uh, get their rights heard. And he said and that's got to be offensive to public policy because it restricts access to justice. So he more or less teamed or teamed access to justice and public policy by saying that's the public policy that I'm talking about. He cannot access his justice, therefore it offends public policy. So the conclusion was the same, but he went a different way. Well, and then how about as the remedy? Um, because when we look at sort of the remedy provided, it wasn't to necessarily get rid of the entire contract. Maybe we want to speak a little bit to the remedy provided under the guise of unconscionability by the majority in this case. Yes, well, and, and this will not come as any surprise to US uh, law students and lawyers that uh, basically, our court said the clause is gone. It said nothing about the contract. They didn't, they didn't strike down the Uber contract, just that clause. But for Canada, this is actually a, a big, big deal. We have traditionally, our unconscionability doctrine was there to get rid of the deal. So unconscionable transaction, the whole deal goes away. 
we have not traditionally seen unconscionability as a remedy to merely carve out a provision and leave the rest intact. We have seen that in other areas. Uh, we saw it in 2011 uh, when, we are, when our Supreme Court tackled the issue of exclusion clauses. And they said, you know, they, and they gave us a test that basically looked a lot like the Uber test, just put into a three-parter. And they said, we can get rid of an unconscionable exclusion clause and the contract is intact. But also in 2011, there was no reference to the fact that that's not usually how Canadian law has done things. So it is a change for Canada, but it's one of those weird changes where it just seems everybody's forgotten the history of this doctrine and have just moved forward with what seems very logical, which, which it does. If there's a problematic provision booted out, you will have some pushback from, I think, economic theorists who will say, well, doesn't that restructure the deal? Um, but I don't think our court's going to be too concerned about that because I would assume their perspective would be, if the deal is fine without this problematic clause, then the clause shouldn't have been there in the first place. So how is your deal affected? And if you're going to tell me that the only reason you put this clause in was to trick the other side into this deal, we have no sympathy for it. So I, I assume that's how they would actually treat that. That is a fun debate, though, because I've definitely heard those arguments, right? The argument is that if you sever out part of the contract and then allow for the contract to go forward, then aren't you rewriting the contract? Are you creating uncertainty in the marketplace? Are you going to wreak havoc on sort of economics and our ability and certainty and our ability to rely on our contracts? Is there any concern or have you seen any, you know, discussion of that yeah. after <laughs> the Uber case came out? Well, the lone dissenting judge wanted to do that. Justice Cote, in her opinion, what she thought should happen was to basically change the arbitration agreement to say, okay, what is problematic about arbitration? And she said, I agree, 15,000 is too much. Having possibly to fly to the Netherlands is too much. Why don't we just rewrite it to say the arbitration has to happen in Ontario and under one of our small centers where either it won't cost much. She even suggested, why not have Uber pay? Because Uber along the way to the Supreme Court had at some point suggested they'd be willing to take on reasonable fees. And so her view was, why don't we just write down this clause that seems problematic and let party autonomy sit? Because her view was, I don't see enough here to tell me that Mr. Heller didn't know there was an arbitration agreement. Maybe he didn't understand its full consequences. So I will get rid of what might not have been obvious as far as the consequences, i.e. The, the spending $15,000. So it was there. And one of the interveners had suggested a, um, a path like that, where they would write down the clause and they used, they referenced a lot of cases from Singapore in their factum, their brief. That's interesting. Well, under U.S. under the U.S. law with unconscionability, that is that's allowable um, under both the Uniform Commercial Code and the Restatement um, Second of Contracts. They specifically say that you can just decide to not enforce the entire deal because it's unconscionable. You can sever out the portion that is bad and enforce the rest, or what we call reformation, which is an equitable remedy where you essentially rewrite the contract. So it sounds as though the dissent was really going for reformation more or less as a possibility. Yeah. And Justice Brown, if there are students out there who are really interested in there, the concurring decision attacked the dissenting on that point, said, no, I think you're going too far with this. Uh, so if you're interested in that area, there was a little uh, discussion between the judges. Yeah. Well, and then that kind of gets to the debate on certainty, because to some extent, one could argue that using the sort of clean public policy route, say, well, this is just void as against public policy, um, perhaps would create a little bit more certainty than using unconscionability. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I don't know, we can go either way on kind of which is more squishy, as they say, um, is public policy or unconscionability more, more uncertain? Well, full disclosure, I'll tell you what I had argued in my factum, and I, I presented the court with a test. And it incorporates all of it. And the test I basically borrowed from that earlier case in 2011. And it's a really straightforward three-part test that says, question one, does the clause here, the arbitration agreement, apply to this dispute? So that would be a scoping question. If the answer is yes, go to the next step. 
is it unconscionable? And you look at that at the time of formation. So you would again look at substantive and procedural. And if it's not unconscionable, then part three is there to say, notwithstanding that it seems like they did agree to this, is there a pressing public policy reason why you should not accept it? And that would be where you could say, yeah, there's something. The reason I thought that that was a more principled approach, of course, I'm biased, is my argument, but I thought it, at least it incorporates all the elements that ultimately the decision finally was talking about, but it does it in a way that you can predict an outcome. And at least for the, the party I was representing, certainty was important. So if we knew that there was a test out there that would allow anyone to just say, all right, would it apply? Let's make it scoping is very clear, sure. Is it unconscionable? Let's work hard to keep it as conscionable as possible. And then you give the court some residual discretion to say, you know, you might have done what you wanted, but at this stage, we're not accepting these kinds of agreements. And while public policy is, is sometimes hard to predict, it's not as difficult as, as it is if a court has given us ideas. So Justice Brown's view that this is an access to justice question, you could predict. Is it reasonable to think that somebody could, would spend half of their yearly income to get justice? It would be pretty easy to give advice to say, probably not, so that clause would fail. So I, I mean, I, that's, I, I wish the court had, had gone with that because it, as a contract professor, it'd also be very easy to teach. <laughs> Instead, now I've got to sort through all of the different views and try to make some sense of it. Yeah. Well, and at the end of the day, when I think about the case and just, I mean, let's face it, I do think the facts were almost perfect, right? I mean, it's like the Netherlands, it's $50,000. I mean, it just sets it up to be so ridiculously unfair. <laughs> There's just yeah. no way the guy is going to pursue his rights. But what do you do with the medium case? What if it's not in the Netherlands, but it's in Chicago? What if it's, I mean, there's a lot of different sort of iterations that we could say are not so bad right so then what would what would happen in the next case i mean what, what do you think i mean what if we said it was going to be under the american arbitration association consumer rules which limit the cost to the consumer in a place like chicago instead of going overseas to the netherlands right and so there might be some kind of and the icc is much more expensive than um, the consumer rules. I mean, do you have a mind of what you think the next case would hold or have there been any test cases percolating? Well, I, I don't know of another case, but I, I have thought about it. And I, so I decided to put on my kind of devil's hat and thought, so how could I advise an Uber to get around something like this? And I thought, would, w imagine this scenario. This is what I've come up with and, and I haven't given it a lot of thought, so I'm sure it's not perfect, but I thought, what if Uber's contract, since it's electronic anyway, had something like this? As the, uh, the driver scrolls down to the different terms, the app says, okay, now here are some options for you. Option A, you get to resolve your disputes in court. In that case, you're, you get 100% of your fare, no problem. Option two, option B, you choose instead to use arbitration. And if you take that, we'll give you 110% of your fee as payment. And anyway, something like that. And now the driver is forced to look at the two and maybe even an option B, they say, and just so you understand, arbitration could be more expensive. You might not get access to a class action. Are you willing to do option B in exchange for more money? And then they, they, the driver clicks yes. I wonder how the court would address that. And yeah. that's why it could be important that they're ignoring the procedural because then they get to say, look, procedurally, I have no argument against you, <laughs> but I still think it's a bad deal. That'll be interesting to see. I mean, we definitely saw that happen in US law. Um, there was sort of a lot of circuit city cases. You may have seen that um, during the 2000s, like there would be these little iterations. There was. Circuit City the Adams and different Circuit City cases where they were kind of changing their contract just a little bit. Same thing with AT&T. I mean, that's how we got to the um, Concepcion case finally um, that hit the US Supreme Court on these issues of unconscionability. And it was mainly that companies tried to address the unconscionability question by doing things like agreeing to pay the fees of the um, consumer 
or um, allowing the um, arbitration to take place in the home state of the consumer. So different ways to kind of make it more fair so that it could pay, pass um, unconscionability analysis. So, so I fully understand exactly what you're talking about in trying to advise Uber on what they might do in their next case. Interesting. I also, one last question um, that came up as I was thinking about the case is, under Canadian arbitration law, is there any kind of an exclusion for transportation workers like we have under the Federal Arbitration Act? No, it, we, the closest we come is our Consumer Protection Act, and not every province has them enacted. This decision, this is another area that has not been investigated yet, but could be problematic for our Consumer Protection Act, because right now in Ontario, the way it treats arbitration agreements is this way. It says a clause in a contract promising to arbitrate in advance is not enforceable. However, a submission agreement, so a clause once a dispute has arisen, yeah, a, a consumer is allowed to agree to. So the question that, that's come to my mind is we have that as a statute, but this decision really doesn't look at it this way. This decision just says, if it's a bad deal, it's a bad deal. There's no agreement. But what would happen if a consumer after the fact agreed to arbitrate. Technically on our, on our statute, that's permissible. This now will even, I think, chop down more consumer arbitrations. And I don't know that that's such a bad thing, frankly. I think, you know, arbitration, I, I, I worked in Europe for an international firm where we did almost exclusively arbitration. Never did we have consumers. I don't think arbitration was built for consumers. It was built for merchants who want specialists. So I don't know that in the end it's so bad, but I suppose if a consumer wanted to use arbitration, then why should the state stand in its way? But yeah, so I, it'll be interesting to see how this case will ever affect the consumer legislation in Canada. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, lots of really interesting wrinkles, especially in light of the Consumer Protection Act and all the different sort of things swirling around. So it'll be interesting to watch the next case and see what happens. Well, thanks for taking the time with us today. This is really, really interesting. And I think it's really important for, um, for law and comparative analysis, especially with US law. So thank you so much for taking time with us today. This was fantastic. Oh, it's my pleasure.